My name is Maya Soren, and I have a PhD not in conflict resolution. My PhD is in uh, radio frequency safety of mobile phones. My biggest party trick is telling people that their mobile phones are really safe. <laughs> <laughs> Science said. Um, but I do know a bit about conflict resolution in especially in distributed communities. Uh, and the kind of communities where people sometimes see each other, sometimes they only know each other via mailing lists. Uh, so having done my PhD in RF safety, I've spent a lot of my time around engineers and scientists and coders and people who consider themselves to have excellent standards of conflict resolution and excellent ways of dealing with each other. Yes, I can see those snorts. I can hear you. <laughs> um, actually, I used to, as an engineer who, who had that opinion of myself, I had appalling, appalling skills at this, I can tell you. So what I'm mostly going to tell you are some war stories and the kinds of things I've learned from them, and the kinds of things I've learned from looking at other people's experiences and frameworks and research on how to do this kind of thing. And maybe at the end, if we have time, there'll be some crowd participation. And this is your warning. Okay. The first thing I learned is that one of the biggest rules people seem to assume about communities is that everyone should be welcome, right? Let's, let, let's, let's take a, a pretty happy view of things. In most communities, people say, look, uh, anyone who can contribute, especially at something called a meritocracy, should be welcome. That's not necessarily true. Um, line number one, uh, you do need filters. Uh, and if you've got filter failure, that's when you have problems. Ah, OK, here is one of my first, one of my favorite war stories. So. Uh, in Australia, there's a, as in many other parts of the world, there's uh, conventions where people get together and talk about science fiction and uh, fantasy and stories and books and fan fiction, all kinds of things. And in 2009, uh, one of the uh, long-standing members of the community contacted the organizers and said, hey, there's this person who's gonna be there, I think. Can you tell me if they're there because uh, they sexually assaulted me and I it didn't happen at an event uh, so these events happen once a year uh, so most of the community knows each other through distributed ways through online through maybe running into each other Australia's a big place uh, I mean there's only 12 people there but it is a big place <laughs> spot the Australians giggling here um, so uh, the Organizers went, wow, that's, that's, that's intense. They spoke to the person uh, and he said, yeah, no, that really happened. I'm really upset about it. I had no idea what to do and I didn't realize that that was a problem at the time. So, you know, it wasn't even a question of he said, she said. There was a clear confession. And when word of this started getting out to the community and uh, there were conversations about, uh, okay, how do we resolve this and who can attend what and maybe we can create a situation where you can both attend some parts of the convention. There was, oh my God, oh, you, can, you can still feel the echoes of those conversations from 2009 on today's internet. Go, oh. um, but, it made people think about what's acceptable. And despite the conversations of, well, that couldn't have happened, or he's a pretty good guy, so we should let him here anyway, uh, the community decided to establish much tighter controls about who could attend what and how to attend things. And it also made them uh, do a few other things as well. Uh, one of the things that they did was listen, just walk in and listen to people and not ask them too many invasive questions about what happened, but have a think about what actually, you know, can, can you tell me what happened? Uh, can you tell me what you want? Uh, they modeled good behavior. Oh, sorry, did you want to take a photo of that? There you are. Um, they modeled good behavior. So they walked around and they, a few of them got together in Bandy and around the situation went, what are we gonna do about this? How are we going to change our community from being the kind of place where people say things like, he might have sexually assaulted someone but he's a really nice guy so he should be here, to the kind of place we want to come to. Uh, and 
they decided to just walk around and be clear about what's okay and they talked to people and they were kind and they were nice and they spoke publicly about their opinion and they spoke publicly and kindly and quietly about the kind of community they wanted it to be. Uh, in 2009, uh, unrelatedly, entirely unrelatedly, um, Alex Bailey, who's pretty famous for being famous on the internet, uh, you know, for being an awesome open source developer and a community manager, uh, at the time gave a keynote at uh, OSCON uh, talking about recruiting diversity and her point was that you've got to start with the diversity you want to see. And that applies for everything. If you want a community that behaves well, you want to start the community well. And if you're already down the wrong track, then what you want to do is lead it, is create a situation where you're leading it, where you're one of the people that are making it a different kind of place. Uh, this is a um, photo of the, at the time, the Dreamwork uh, dev team. Do people know what Dreamwork is? Does anyone remember LiveJournal? Does anyone even know what LiveJournal is? Okay, it was a blogging platform back when those kinds of things were a little cooler than now. Um, and uh, it was a publicly accessible place where anyone could go and set up a blog, a little bit like WordPress, but not, not at all really like WordPress. But in some ways, a bit like it, in that it, in that it offered the same kind of features. Um, but after a while they started treating some of their members pretty badly, refusing some content, closing accounts. Uh, so some of their developers left and created a competitive program, a competitive service, which was basically the same thing, but better, called DreamWidth. And this is their diversity statement. We welcome you. We welcome people of any gender identity or expression, race, ethnicity, size, nationality, sexual orientation, ability level, neurotype. We welcome fans, geeks, nerds, pixel stained, techno peasant wretches. We welcome internet beginners who aren't sure what any of those terms refer to. You might wear a baby sling, a hijab, a kippah, a leather, piercings, a pentacle, anything. So this was their diversity statement. This was them standing up for the community that they wanted to see. They modeled good behavior. Their diversity statement is still one of the best I've ever seen. Why do they want to do that? Um, for a start, you have a community, you value it, you want it. Um, there are some people in the community whose boundaries aren't as clearly enforceable as other people's. Sometimes they're women, sometimes they're queer people, sometimes they're poor people, sometimes they're people of a different race, Sometimes they're people who wear a lot of jewellery through their eyeballs. And society generally views those people as less worthy of having their filters enforced. It's your job to do it. If you can, it's a really nice thing to be able to stand up for other people who might not have the freedom to do it for themselves. But do it in a kind way. It's not always what you think is going on. I've been in a lot of situations where one person's saying, look, uh, this person's really upset me and they hurt me and they shouldn't be here. In fact, I don't think they should belong to this community at all. And it turns out, uh, after listening to them, that actually both people can coexist, but both, both, both ends are okay. And what you've got is a culture clash. Some people think that there's one thing going on uh, or that the community is about something else and other people think that there's something else going on. It's very important to be able to just listen to them. And you can do that via email as well. And it's hard, and it's not fun. Who's ever had to try and resolve a conflict via email, incidentally? Yeah, yeah, you're those people with that thousand yards there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, one of the other things that the people in the speculative science fiction community would stack, stack the odds, okay? So they uh, sat among themselves and they went, we want to change the community, right? Who's going to be on the board next year? Right, what about the year after that? And the year after that? And they did that for three years running. They figured out who was going to put forward the effort of being on the board and they did it in a systematic way so that none of them wore out all at once. They all wore out eventually. Uh, it's hard doing this kind of thing, but they had a really serious program in place where 
who's going to be on the board and who's going to be on the conference organizing committee, who's going to be contacting people, who's going to be writing the anti-harassment policy. And they, they actually changed it. They got together and they, and they sat in the background. There's always, you know, there's always the meta channel. There's the channel where everyone's talking and then there's the channel for where everyone's talking about how you talk to each other. They stack the odds in the meta channel. <coughs> it's not considered very nice to isolate the problem person, but it's actually been shown in a bunch of different studies. Uh, every time there's a study that talks about how do you change the culture at your workplace, one of the highest value things that can happen in a workplace is to remove the one or two really toxic people. And uh, most studies you'll come across if you're looking into workplace improvements will either avoid this topic entirely or focus on it very strongly. Um, Removing the problem, like one or two serious problem people has more increased value for an organization than any collection of workshops, any away days, any kind of team building exercises. Yeah, education is inoculation. Uh, vaccinate your community against how you don't want them to behave, what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. Uh, the people at this particular convention, they, uh, for several years in a row, started running as a parallel track to everything else in the conference, safe spaces workshops, which was all about how to say yes, how to say no, what is consent, what is okay, how do you ask for consent, how do you establish it, how do you establish safety, how do you make yourself a safe person to be around, why would you want to do that? And it wasn't even with the aim, that they never talked about this is to stop sexual harassment happening again, although of course it is. But it was to give people the tools to deal with how to behave the next time they were in an uncomfortable situation. Whether it was when someone's accused them of something that they weren't sure they'd done, or how to recognize when they might be about to cross someone's boundary, or how to just stand up for themselves. Uh, and you know what? It's a really different place now. The, the entire sci-fi convention world in Australia, small and incestuous as it is, like all other worlds in Australia, is very different. Okay, this is another story. Um, pretty famous um, open source female-led project. In fact, I think for a long time they were at 95% female contributors. I'm not going to name it. Uh, they had all kinds of problems. They had various different kinds of boards. And again, this is a situation where the meta channel wasn't... This is actually a situation where the meta channel was the problem. They had several meta channels and they hadn't spoken to each other well enough. And there were a couple of toxic people around, and nobody knew how to deal with them. And nobody knew what to do about it. So, uh, I, I've had a lot, you know, I've spoken to a lot of the people who are involved in it one on one or in little groups, and a lot of them say the same kind of thing, which is we just didn't know how to get past the barriers. And they had online channels, and they would talk to each other, and sometimes they needed to do things like just. Again, model good behavior, one of them would sit around and welcome any newbie and would sit around to the testers and say, so, are you giving a bug report to a developer? It's kind of like telling them they have an ugly baby. Be gentle with it. Ask questions, you know. D don't walk in and say, I can't work with this, this is rubbish. That's probably not going to get you very far. Here's another situation. Maybe you could walk in and say, I don't really know how to start developing or testing this. Can you give me a hand understanding your code? And that made a big difference. Uh, and the channels and the meta channels did get better, and then got worse, and then got better, and then got worse. But overall, they did pretty well. Um, I'm going to come back to that one. Okay. One of the things you need to be able to do in a community is know who to talk to and how to address a problem. So you've encountered a situation.
someone's accused you of bad behavior, or you've encountered bad behavior, maybe it was at a conference event, maybe it was post-conference events, maybe it was online, maybe someone sent you, what would I do? I don't want to have to like walk up to everyone and tell them that I'm embarrassed that this guy's felt me up or that I think I've done something really bad. I just want to find somebody to talk to quietly. So it's very important to be able to make those choices visible to your community. Uh, let them know who to contact. Have an email address, have a Twitter account, have people in t-shirts, something. This is work. Reinforcing boundaries, teaching people, creating filters. It's hard, it's labor. It's what's going to make your organization. It's going to make it, make or break it. Like, in a lot of ways, it's what's going to make your organization better than, much more than whether you can sell widgets or better than the kind of code you can do. This is what's going to make it. You know, there's that saying about how people don't leave jobs or organizations, they leave bosses or they leave their workmates. This is, this is the same kind of thing. What you want is somebody making the place safe. So when you are thinking about how to set up a community or how to resolve the conflicts, think about how you're going to moderate it and how you're going to compensate that, either with money or with something else. One of the things you can do is lower the barrier of entry for the more vulnerable people, the people who don't want to speak up. Uh, sometimes the conflicts arise because people feel like they can't speak about them. And they can't speak about them because they're part of a minority group or, I don't know, maybe they have a disability and they don't want to have to call anyone else up every time and say, I'm in a wheelchair, can you tell me where the stairs are? So they don't show up. Or they're snarky on a mailing list about it, which is fair enough, I'd be snarky too. I mean, it's not a fun or a nice thing to be, but I can really understand why they'd be angry. What you want to do is lower the barrier of entry for people who can't do it for themselves necessarily, or for whom it's harder. Oh, one of the coolest stories I've heard is um, there's a little corner of the internet called Metafilter, Mephi for short, and they, they, they were Reddit before Reddit. They're still online. They're a really unattractive website, actually, really plain. What they do is uh, they keep, like they have a moderator that they pay, they're very clear on, on their moderation rules. Um, they charge people a $5 annual fee to participate in the community to post, right? It, I mean, it's a small sum of money, but the pain of you know dealing with PayPal or credit cards or whatever to create an account and, and and do all that means that they are less likely to get scammers, that they're less likely to get the kind of people who are going to be sock puppets or pains in the ass about it, or, you know, you're less likely to get the kind of people who are going to be difficult if there is a small barrier to participation. Remember that everyone who is in a more vulnerable position is making a cost-to-benefit calculation in their head before they post anything. Uh, anyone vulnerable has to sit there and think, if I say my opinion on this forum, am I going to get backlash? People who don't have to think that, maybe they can. Maybe you can make that a little more fair for them. One of the good things to make clear is that there's no opt-in to good behavior. Uh, you, you, like, there's no opt-out, you just are, you are. Yeah, there's no opt-in to good behavior. You can opt out by leaving, and it's okay. Like, it's really okay to leave a community. Bye. <laughs> um, the best way to do things is to create a code of conduct. Yes, you have people. Yes, you need to let them know how you behave. The reality is you already have a code of conduct. Your community has unspoken rules of ways in which it is okay and not okay to behave. For, for example, we are all wearing clothes. <laughs> I, I didn't even think about it today, did you? We, we have all these assumed assumptions about life that life teaches us, and sometimes the group teaches us by subtle punishment or subtle encouragement about what's okay and what's not okay. So creating a code of conduct is actually just formalizing the rules of what things are. 
here's an example of a code of conduct that your community might not want, but a different <coughs> community did. This is uh, one of the channels of Anonymous. Uh, does everyone know who Anonymous is? <coughs> they're, uh, hmm. they're a desperate online group of people who behave as, among other things, activists against whatever causes they feel like. And initially, they were all anonymous. That was the point that nobody knew who they were. Um, some of them have come to light since. The point is, the, their code of conduct is not necessarily what you want, but this is the code of conduct that worked for them. This is one of our channels. Nobody kicks, nobody bans inside this channel. You don't interrupt another person's channel. Personal disputes are taboo. That's often a good one. Uh, but, you know, sometimes, uh, like, like the last uh, one over here, so don't expect the IRC cops to handle your problems for you. Try and resolve it yourself. That's not always true. Some communities prefer to have a moderator get involved earlier. Be specific about what is and isn't okay, and be specific about what you can and can't do. Does this look familiar? This is uh, the Drupal uh, conflict resolution uh, guidelines. They're really good. And when I read them, I went, wow, there's a community that's dealt with conflict. Because like, you can always tell who has and hasn't dealt with problems by how specific they are in what to do when it happens. <laughs> um, like, like uh, uh, there's, um, there's a condom packet you can buy where one of the instructions is please do not send used product back to company. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think those kinds of rules develop by accident. They develop when someone's done it. <laughs> yeah. Um, consequences, yeah, okay. Once you've got a code of conduct, once you've created a boundary, the only way to enforce it is clear and fast. Clear and hard, real quick. You don't want there to be any questions that the code of conduct has been enforced. You, you need to be kind, you need to be gentle, you need to hear all sides, but you need to do it. Your, fir your only chance as having an effective boundary is to enforce it the first time it's broken. Yep, it's okay to ban people. It's not the first resort. It's rarely the first resort. And if it is, maybe that's not the community for you. Maybe it is the community for you, that's your choice. But remember, it is your role to ensure that things are in fact resolved, and one of the ways to resolve them is to revisit, is to visit consequences, and one of the consequences are being asked to leave the community, or being banned from the community. Oh, this is one of my favorite stories, okay. 2005, KiwiCon. Uh, KiwiCon is a conference uh, about security that happens in New Zealand once a year. Uh, they call themselves the absolute best one. It's true, they're also the only one. They're very clear to uh, say that. Um, in 2015, so December last year, um, they had uh, their keynote speaker, personal invited friend of the organizers, stood on stage and made a transphobic joke as part of their speech. Uh, and uh, the... Organizers got into sudden shock, okay, and let them finish and took them aside and sat them down and said, what the hell was that? And made them pack their bags and leave the conference then and there. I don't care that you don't have a hotel to stay for the night. I don't care where you're going next. You're leaving now. My favorite story, just the clearest public declaration that we are going to make this space safe for you. And, you know, I'm sure those people, the organizer and the speaker, later had a lot of words and later had a lot of conversations about their own internal conflict and what is and isn't okay and who embarrassed who, actually. Um, but they were clear about it. And look, this was their uh, report about the conference. We had cyber flames, lasers, significant facial damage, hackers, crackers, jackers, directors, and as far as we know, only one creeper. They also removed all other references to this person from their conference, removed their, um, all the stuff from the uh, program, so you can't find them anymore. But they did it. 
they were kind by being kind to their community. You know, there was no question of what happened. If you can be public about what's going on, even if the conflict is private, have the conversations in private, but have a public conversation, mention it somewhere. It's really important to let people know that if there is a problem, someone will step in, someone will do something about it, it will be dealt with, and you're not the only one dealing with it. You always get to choose. You always get to, you know, in, in the situation of he said, she said, in the situation of two people, at least one of those people is hurt and upset, right? At least one of those people has had probably, potentially, something awful happen to them. Maybe mildly awful, but by the time they're speaking to a moderator, it's not mild anymore usually. You know, people normally wait until there's a problem before they talk to someone. You get to choose whose side you're on. Oh yeah, okay, so I'm going to tell you one of the most awful stories from my life. A long time ago, I was president of a committee of a uh, community that dealt with alternative sexualities. So again, I mean it had nothing to do with software, but there were a lot of people there who were part of a distributed community, who uh, mostly see each other you know, once a month, a couple of times a month, There'd be a lot of conversations online, on email, on Facebook, on forums. And we had a case of uh, somebody accusing their partner of domestic violence. Uh, it happens. Um, and we as a group had to seriously think about what to do about it. Um, how do we gather evidence for that? Uh, Okay, so maybe the police are involved, maybe they're not. It's a group that deals with relationships, so people have relationships within the group. It's not like, like for example, if we'd been uh, organising a drug and alcohol recovery group, there there are rules that say things like uh, avoid dating anyone within this community. It wasn't like that. People date each other all the time. And one of the decisions we came to is that um, because we know this and because it was a relationship based situation if there are people around who are abusive in relationships and we know that then by allowing them in the group we were de facto standing up for them and saying this person is an okay person to date and it was a lot of big conversations about you know is it our job to save people from crap relationships well no but abusive maybe you know what do we do about that and we didn't know what to do. And there were months and there were terrible, terrible situations. And oh my God, we are. The worst thing I think I did in that situation was create um, a group discussion where I knew not everyone was capable of dealing with what was going on, but uh, we decided to have a consensus-based agreement about what to do with this person and therefore with the community guidelines as a whole. And so that meant we had to have all of the all of the organisers agree before we did something. I can't even tell you how much that. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, every, yeah. P people who've tried this are shaking their heads. All I can tell you is don't do that. Like, there are good ways to build consensus, but in order to have consensus-based decision-making, you first need to have years of training your community in how to come to a consensus-based decision. And if you don't have, which, like student politics does that a lot, but if you don't have that in place, then the moment there's a conflict, you're dealing with how to resolve conflicts, and you barely get to what do we do about this particular conflict. So for a time we thought we were off topic, or maybe we were off the values. Maybe we weren't on the values of the community, so we had to re-establish them. Maybe we weren't talking about what was the right thing. Actually, what we decided was something else. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. Another story from a little more recently. Um, I'm, uh, I've just been on the board of uh, the Australian Open Knowledge Foundation. Uh, which is an arm of the Global Open Knowledge Group, and which has been around for a long time, and we do things that are open. 
And that's everything from open government to science to education to data to you name it. Um, and we, I've been living in Melbourne a long time. In Melbourne, we've had a really sensational community. Things are so good. We wrote our own code of conduct for uh, all of Australia. We have weekly events. We have a thriving community. We constantly have new volunteers to come and do stuff here. Like, like that is a real sign of a, of a thriving world. Um, and then, just recently, we got into a massive fight on the mailing list among the um, organisers. <laughs> so it was, you know, it ended up being one city versus another city. And what we came to realise is that we weren't, thank you, we weren't off topic or off values. We were something else. We didn't know how to talk as moderators. What we didn't have was the right structure for us. What I learned is that you can't make anyone do anything. This is all this happened when I was in India. I was living in Hyderabad, I am for a year or two, and all of this was happening in Australia, and I was watching the mailing list and watching the Twitter feed and starting to cry because these are all people I care about, and what are they doing fighting with each other, and this is a community I actually built from scratch, like all of us started with nothing. And suddenly they were, ah. so, you know, there were midnight phone calls, and 6 a.m. phone calls to try and catch people at the right time zones and I'm so sorry that happened to you and okay can you tell me what happened what's going on can we have a phone conversation all together <coughs> all right what I learned is that I couldn't make anyone apologize to anyone like I couldn't make anything happen I could just talk with people I could give them information I could create any situation I wanted but it was up to them I tried to create mess lists, you know, one of the things that did work was making less distance, was even though people were distributed, getting them all together into the same room, even into the same conference call made a big difference. You know, they're human now. This isn't just some person whose name I see on a mailing list who uh, I find really annoying. It's always personal. It's always somebody's upset. You've got to remember that someone's upset, actually. It's not about logic. Like, yeah, there's logical reasons and there's time for logical conversations, but it's not the first response you've got to deal with. Yeah, we're off topic, we're off values. Actually, what we didn't know was how to resolve moderator things. And uh, what's happening in Australia is that we are too distributed and we haven't come to an agreement about how to deal with moderator conflicts. And we don't, what, what we discovered is that we don't have conversations among moderators enough. So like the Melbourne group is really active, the Sydney group is really active, each of the different cities is, is functioning very well, but intercity we don't have agreements about what our culture is. <laughs> Best advice I can give you is to have the most awkward conversation you can possibly think of. Start early, think about it. It's your job to have, like, it's, as anyone who's part of a community, it's your job to make things less awkward for other people. Sometimes that means being really awkward for a few minutes at a time. You've got to normalize it. You've got to make it normal. You've got to make it okay to have conflict. The best way to do it is to sit down with someone and say, how do you want to talk about things? When we have conflict, what makes you feel more listened to? What, what kind of words do you want me to not use? What makes you angry? How can we resolve what we're doing? How can we talk amongst ourselves? What do you want out of a resolution? If you're not doing that, what you're normalizing is unresolved conflict, is people not resolving stuff, is people leaving, is people not talking to each other, is I'm not going to that event if you're invited that person. <laughs> Uh, yeah, cool. So there's this really good framework uh, for thinking about, among other things, conflict resolution. Well, it's about values in the workplace. Uh, really worth thinking about, giving voice to values. Um, one of the things I talk about is think about what helps you speak up. One of the things that makes things work really well is knowing ahead of time what's going to make it easier for you to talk on behalf of someone else, on behalf of yourself, when values are breached, what are your values? But what sort of story do you tell yourself about who you are? Am I a brave person? 
Uh, okay, in that case, I can talk because I'm feeling brave. Am I timid? Am I like really shy? Okay, but do you like complying with values? Do you like complying with the rules? In that case, maybe it helps you speak up when there are clear rules and you know that you're following them. Maybe it's because you're, whatever stories you tell yourself. You know, the story I tell myself in that picture is that I knit and I really like plants. That was a photo I took of my lap at an airport after I'd taken some um, black pepper cuttings from somewhere. One of the other stories I tell myself is that I get really angry. It's actually not that true. Um, but I, I found for a long time that that really helped me, like thinking about, about in terms of anger at injustices. Okay, what's the time now? Anyone? One thirty. Excellent. We've got time. Okay, and it's a small group, so we're definitely going to be able to do it. So, has anyone he ever heard this phrase? When is the best time to plant a tree? Yeah, the best time is twenty years ago. You know, you want to start your community with a code of conduct. You want to start your community with good ways of resolving conflict. Second best time is right now. So, what we're going to do? Okay, we're going to do the. Now it is time for the audience participation part of things. I would like you to find a partner. The person you're sitting next to is really good. If you're not sitting next to anyone and you don't want to, that's your choice. If you do want to get involved, find yourself a partner. Yes. And here's what we're going to do. You're going to trip over there and try not to die. That's what you're going to do. <laughs> um, what you're going to do is think about the m conversation you want to have least. The most awkward conversation you can think of. Maybe it's with your parents, maybe it's with your partner, maybe it's with someone at work, maybe it's with your boss, maybe it's with your kids, maybe it's with yourself. Think about that conversation that makes you just go, <laughs> you know, that, 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 that suddenly makes you want to play Candy Crush and, and run away and, 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 and watch rubbish television. No, 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 I want to do anything else but think about it. Think about that one and practice having it. Great. The best thing you can do is get yourself ready for the situations before they occur, right? The best thing that's going to help you be awkward and know how to deal with a problem. The reason the code of conduct with conflict resolution is good is because people have anticipated what to do when a problem arises. So, you're probably going to have to deal with whatever it is that you're avoiding. Find somebody, each of you, think about the conversation you don't want to have and try and have a role play with the person next to you about that conversation. Just try and have it with someone right now. Prepare yourself. Here you go. Yes. Yes. Wow. I'm available for conversation if anyone wants to. It is so annoying. It's just sick.
starting to die a bit. What did you get out of that? Did, did anyone actually have an awkward conversation? L like attempt? Yeah, a couple, yeah, awesome. Anyone else? Actually try and have like a bit of a trial, yeah? A few? What did you get out of it? Yeah, I more, you, you talk through it, you know, okay, what, 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 what to talk, talk, and also what you, you're rehearsing it, right? Obviously, you're not having that conversation now, but you're seeing it. Hmm. So you know where you falter or where you struggle, <laughs> struggle through it. So. Yep. Anyone else? You're clearly all very expert at the awkward. Yeah, yeah how'd you go? Yeah, two, there was a country Germany. It gave me his name as required. Like, so mm -hmm. what, what are the points they have? They have to give up our attitude. Sometimes they feel something emotionally they are in the same job place or 
going completely. The they are saying you are a great problem and uh, when one is putting it hurts me. So I, in our conversation we get that uh, we clear, like what was our expectation for that person that we clearly explain in that case it will help. Hmm. The clarity is very, very much required in your such conversation whenever we have any such uh, we face any such conflict. Yep. In teams or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah, cool. How did you go? I almost uh, felt the same thing, whatever they say. The way we tell, uh, uh, tell this person, we should make sure that uh, we don't use um, any strong words, that we uh, very soft and whatever uh, we speak, and um, we should not uh, go into too much detail, and uh, we should uh, touch on those points that are very important and uh, not ideal. Cool, thanks. What about you four at the front? How did you go? I actually forced competition on her. That's okay. You're still alive. <laughs> did it hurt? I, I, it's, it's actually, it was very helpful because you actually listened to what I said and, and even took notes. Like, oh, come on. I, I don't know if, if you're actually going to follow through on that, but at least it made me feel like, like what I was saying wasn't just being like, oh, that's stupid. Once or 50, or no one cares. And takes over. No. So I get a lot. And people a lot of times ask yeah. me, I say, I don't want photos taken. And I go, why? Why would you possibly? Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Awesome. Anyone else? We were bad and we just talked about private conduct. <laughs> <laughs> the solution stuff that we always talk about. Is that the thing you talk about? It is. Yeah. <laughs> we all sit on the community work. Well, I guess yeah. I don't mean, like, the community work. Yeah, I've seen your names on a lot of the good documents. Oh, nice. Yeah. Well, so one of the things I had a question about, I don't know if this is the right time, but like, you know, you mentioned the science fiction uh, community, how you know, this, this incident happened and it was kind of a catalyst moment for the community kind of deciding what sort of direction you wanted to go. Yeah. And you mentioned that it's a much better community now. And I was curious how much you attribute that to like obviously things like from the safe space workshop is just excellent. Like that's education and that's it's, it's kind of opt-in education so it allows people who want to be empowered to be empowered. But I'm curious, <laughs> not to be cynical, but how much of that was also attributed to attrition? Like people either either deliberate attrition, you're like, you're no longer welcome here, but also attrition in that um, if you're doing safe space workshops, this is no longer my community. And then sort of people self-selecting to leave yeah. and leave only the uh, nice people who leave the same. Yeah, I'm not sure how much uh, everyone heard, but uh, the question was, in the sci-fi community, I was talking about uh, seeing the community is better, how much is that is uh, attributable to the efforts that these people have taken, specifically like the safe space workshops, and how much is it due to attrition? Uh, and I think you're dead on the money. <laughs> the moment you create rules that say this kind of thing is not okay here, the kind of people who behave like that are less likely to be there, or to stay there or to behave like that because it's not encouraged and there's at least a piece of paper somewhere that says that's not okay and that's not acceptable here, especially if it's publicly visible that there will be consequences. And the self-select out is actually the simplest way that communities improve. Because community, when the communities declare what their values are and what is and isn't okay, uh, the people who don't behave like that either leave or are made to leave by uh, direct or indirect behavior, by punishment, or by actual ban ban that kind of thing. Yes? And here's an open conversation. Yes. Um, we also risk swinging the pendulum too far. Yep. And I had an interesting conversation with someone who has consciously chosen in, this, in the US to mentor poor rural, redneck, white guys mm. because there is nothing yeah. out there for them. Mm. And we are making a whole bunch of spaces not safe yep. for them. That's great. <laughs> That's one of the most interesting things that are happening now. There's so much. not welcome rednecks. Debatable. So uh, the point was, um, it's possible to swing too far. So um, Donna raised the issue of somebody actually starting an education program for poor, remote, rural, white, redneck, redneck white, guys. white guys. Yeah, yeah, they, they need education. In fact, 
Uh, that's one of the things that the sex worker community talks most about. Sex worker and safe sex and uh, sex positivity groups talk about the most that there is no healthy good way for, you know, the most privileged in society normally for middle class middle aged white guys to get involved in alternative sexuality stuff without coming across as creepy and everyone suddenly going, what are you doing here? <laughs> no, 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 we need to make the safe, safe space for the queer and the women. Go away. Yeah, and that's a problem. Yeah, and it's actually a problem uh, with marginalizing health issues as well. Uh, not, that, not that I think we've swung too far. Like Most guys are still predominantly tested on healthy white people. Um, yeah. But there's actually a lot of drugs that are given less precedence for research because uh, it's an issue that affects men, for example. Uh, yes, yes, it's an issue, and yes, that is a really awkward conversation to have. Yeah. Okay, question. Yeah. Question. Really questions. I know. <laughs> so, so something you said that, that I still struggle with is the, the point you made about um, being being transparent when when there is a difficult conversation and there, there's some outcome from it, mm. um, and then being transparent about the fact that the conversation. And um, I, I'm trying to like this is something that Andrew says all the time. This is what like, like like do it in public, make sure everyone knows. Um, and while I, I definitely see the value of that for for other people who might have had the same experience, I don't know that it's that it's either don't know that it's safe to come forward or don't know that these expectations exist. Um, what I really struggle with is is how how to do that without making something that is already awful for at least two people already much worse. Yeah. Um, so, so if you're in a situation where you, you've been harassed from a situation where you're uncomfortable and and like it was, you know that it was like in the grand scheme of harassment, yeah, yeah, yeah. like it wasn't potentially violent to you, but at the same time it was awful for you. You don't want to either make the, the person who was on the other side of that situation, like you don't want to make them a target of, of like villainy that they don't deserve. You also don't want to have to live with it anymore. Um, like how, how do you, yeah, how do you balance that? that? Like, how can you be transparent about that while still respecting the privacy? It's balancing transparency and privacy. Yeah, balancing transparency and privacy, hard. <coughs> hard, awkward, difficult, case by case is the short version. Um, sometimes it's enough for most people won't have known what's happened. Okay? O almost nobody except people who were there during an incident know what happened. Unless it was something that happened publicly on the list. Uh, in which case, if, okay, if the event is public, uh, no question, the response and the consequences are public. Like, you can have a lot of conversations in the background, but if something's happened publicly, if everyone knows about it, no question. The other end of the spectrum, something's happened privately. Uh, it's still important for the community to know that an incident has occurred, an incident was dealt with, the consequences have been revisited or visited or smited upon the various individuals. <laughs> We haven't got enough smarty. There is just smarty. never enough smarty, it's true. Um, but also that this is a thing that happens and that it's normal. So you can usually hide the people's names. That doesn't always hide them. Yeah. We've done right, things like say um, you know, a high profile contributor. Yeah, a high profile contributor. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. With, you know, uh, another attendee at the uh -huh. So anyone who's there knows exactly what they're right. talking about. Right. But everybody else is like, oh, well, that sounds reasonable. Like you know, like, so or there's suddenly a giant fight in among the community. About who's that? I know, and why is that okay? And I wouldn't have done that. And yeah. you know, this one time, this other thing happened to me. Or this thing happened to a friend of a friend. Yeah. yeah. Um, look, you can't get it right. People will talk. People will gossip. Most people are idiots, yourself included, myself included. We're all idiots sometimes. It's OK. Look, you know, you're not going to make it great by not talking about it. The question is, which is going to be worse, having said something publicly or having said nothing publicly? But uh, it's, not a question of, it's not always a question of which is better. Sometimes it's a question of which is going to be worse, doing it or not doing it. And who is it going to be worse for? Exactly. Right. Off the rights of different right. people. One, one person's yeah. right to like, not have to think about this thing happening. Right. Versus the community's right to know that yeah. something did happen. 
yeah. or and people's yeah, and, and the problem is, of course, that there are consequences be, like in the case of an assault or something like that. The fact is, the victim of the assault is going to be experiencing the consequences of it regardless of what happens. And you can make it easier for them, maybe, by not mentioning the thing publicly. But in, if your code of conduct specifically states when there are incidents, we will let the community know then they know what they're signing up for as well. Um, and yeah, sometimes it sucks, and sometimes nobody wins right now, but sometimes other people will be later. Um, I'm very happy to have a conversation, but I think it's time to move on. Are you having like a code of conduct versus a feather? Uh, I don't know, is anyone holding one of those? Would anyone like to hold one of those? <laughs> <laughs> uh, not this time. But very Maybe happy. Sure. <laughs> yes, and look, there I am. Oh, totally good then. Right. Thanks, everyone.